This is a Media Lab podcast. What the shit is this? Whoa, 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 Kyle. What, Kyle, cool it, man. What's what? going on? What's going on? I'm, I'm about to blow my top here. This machine... What do you mean, this machine? ...is bringing guns into my house. I'm just stuck on the fact that you just said blow my top. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, you should know something about me, Dave, in that I am a 1940s villain, so... <laughs> I, what is the machine doing with guns? Hasn't it already caused know. enough fucking damage by making it's us watch these movies? It's already an instrument of destruction, as far as I am concerned. And just, like, like look at this. I it's it's an old style like six shooter revolver, but oh. it like bought it legally, of course, but shipped to my house. What what do you need a gun for? What are you a cop? That is the penultimate question. Didn't we bring this up last week? What what is it that we need guns for, Kyle? War. What is it good for? In his own garage, Kyle has built a machine. Cobbled together with parts found in his friend's church basement and a dumpster behind the local Dairy Queen, this monstrosity is now alive and evil. Kyle has convinced his friend Dave to help stop the apocalypse by reviewing films the machine picks. The ultimate purpose is still unknown, and Kyle could have probably done this himself, but he's not being dragged to hell alone. This, this is, is Kyle, Kyle and Dave, Dave versus, 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 versus The Machine. The machine. Welcome to Kyle and Dave vs. the Machine. My name is Kyle. I am David. And I'm the Machine. A podcast where a sentient machine forces us to watch movies in order to prevent it from initiating the apocalypse. Although we do tend to talk about the ideas of the movie rather than the movie itself. Uh, for whatever reason, the machine is laser focused on the year 1999. And today, we're going to be talking about the Iron Giant. <laughs> Two nights ago, a SATCOM radar detected an unidentified object entering Earth's atmosphere. Invaders from Mars. Some assumed it was a large meteor or a downed satellite. This is no meteor, gentlemen. <laughs> this is something much more dangerous. <laughs> Dave, what is your relationship with the Iron Giant? And not the Iron Giant that is in the room with me currently right now, but the movie, The Iron Giant. I I don't know. I know of it. I know that it's good, but... You've never watched it. Yeah, the more I think about it, I couldn't tell you anything about it. So I'm guessing that I've never watched it. Okay, I love this movie, although I came to it many years after 1999. Absolutely did not see it the year it came out. Uh, you'll know from last week that, of course, I was up on the Disney stuff that was going on. I watched this, I'm going to say circa 2006, maybe 2007 is the very first time I watched it. Bought it on DVD, sight unseen, Ooh. as I was collecting movies at the time, and I was working at the bookstore so i got a discount for from our movie section i uh, took it home watched it and loved it like fell in love with this movie i am obviously a fan of 2d animation although it, the giant uses 3d animation in this film but everything else around it is 2d animation and i and i still uh, I love it i feel like i'm talking about like black and white movies uh should it still be made we should never transition into color but uh, that's how i feel about 2d animation sometimes oh i love 2d i i think on the like i haven't watched this movie but um you know like for example in the anime world uh the overuse of 3d is starting to really wear on me all, all mm. the characters and movements are starting to look the same and uh, I don't know if that's a rendering engine or a uh, conglomerate of animators problem but there's something about the advancement of technology for example uh, our overlords at apple uh, versus all of the other devices, they all are actually kind of... I don't want to offend you, because I know you're part of the uh, priesthood, but uh, they're all kind of the same, right? Are we really getting a lot of variety anymore? Back in the days, you know? No, I, I agree with that. I mean, by and large, uh, most smartphones are going to be fairly similar. You're basically buying it for 
certain features <laughs> and, that and you want or to stay within the, the ecosystem. Right. I mean, well, I'm, I'm part of the cult. Everything I have is Apple, so I don't want to uh, be too big of a hater, but... I mean, I, maybe you're more aligned with Hayao Miyazaki, uh, who I'm a big fan of. I love his films. Uh, I had to call this up. I cannot remember this off the top of my head. I don't know if you've seen this video of these people that came to him to present him with how he could make more films by utilizing 3D, by using 3D animation, because obviously he is not going to 3D animate, but it's like, you come up with a story, do some rough designs, and someone can take that and make the movie. Did he chase them out with like a broom or something? No, he was very kind, but what he said is like so extremely devastating that I would like crumple up into a ball. He said, and I quote, I strongly feel that this is an insult to life itself. <laughs> and that <laughs> I kind of wish you were reading and, this in Japanese, Kyle. But... Uh, yeah. And that and that uh, using AI generated animation of a human like being it has too many creepy movements that might be applied to say zombies in a video game. Anyway, so he is definitely on, on on that side. I'm not here to say that every 3D film is bad. I am not. I have there's things I love sure. and even my top movies of all time. But there is something to the style and quality of 2D animated films that I wish was at least still done occasionally in in North America. There's, I mean, this might be too broad a generalization, but you could. It's like the idea of classic art. There's a, a reflection in 2D of a single person's artistic intent on how they want to express, let's say, an emotion or a backdrop or a character. That's why comic books were so cool. Mm -hmm. You know, you, we used to know who the artists were more as much as, you know, the characters. But that's and, going and to your away. point is like as beautiful as some of the Pixar movies are as uh, like Sony and everyone else who does 3D animation. There is at a certain point like, yeah, this kind of all looks the same. Like there's no specific style that i can see here and there there was a time there the movie tangled about um Rap uh, rapunzel, rapunzel rapunzel i like that movie you know, yeah. yeah done in 3d animation but in early early in its development process i remember being online at the time and being excited because originally what they wanted to do was style it after the rembrandt painting of rapunzel and they want to do the whole film as if it was like a moving Rembrandt painting. Big, I'm like, that's, that's cool. Yeah. I want, I totally want to see that happen. And uh, I wish there was more of that, where there was more stylizations. Like and maybe I think Pixar is trying to do that a little bit. Um, but uh, at least of what their newer films they're trying to do. But I don't know. I need to see more style. Spider Man was successful. I mean, I love the Spider Verse. Yeah, yeah Spider Verse. So, that's a, a great, movie. great example. Yeah. Uh, again, a lot of that is 3D animated stuff as well, but. Still kind of in that 2D style occasionally. Yeah. Cell, we used to call it cell shading. Cell that, shaded animation. I don't that think that's right. the term anymore. But uh, You're yeah. old man. Let's okay. See. Well, let's do this. Let's go thank some sponsors. And then when we come back, we'll start talking about the Iron Giant. We need to talk about adding a rotary dial to your machine <laughs> just to make me feel... Like I, I connect with it somehow. Hi there, everyone. Kyle here to tell you about some of our sponsors that help make this show possible. We'll be right back to talking about the Iron Giant momentarily. How great is it to be watching a movie and take your mind off of the fact that a hulking sentient machine is only just around the corner to possibly end the world? Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This episode of Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine is brought to you by World on Fire, a new podcast from CBC Edmonton. World on Fire is a new five-part series that takes you to the front lines of out-of-control wildfires in Canada, Australia, and California. Here's a preview. Some people say the end is near. Some say that it's already here. Holy Look at that! Ah! Oh no! Hang on, honey, we're gonna be okay. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, and I'm hosting a new podcast called World on Fire. Along with wildfire expert Mike Flanagan, we're taking you to the front lines of fires burning out of control in North America, Australia, even the Arctic. 
We'll meet the reporters who are covering these devastating stories and hear from the people who, despite terrible loss, rebuild again and again. This goes on, and like when I grow up, maybe that this is going to be even worse, and I might actually be in a situation where there's a wildfire around me. We'll tell you what the future holds and take you inside the latest tools and technology providing hope. That's World on Fire, a five-part original podcast from CBC Edmonton, available on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. Find World on Fire on the CBC Listen app or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find it online at cbc.ca slash worldonfire. This week, Kyle and Dave vs. the Machine is also brought to you by Pod Power. With Pod Power, ATB is making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This episode, we're giving a Pod Power shout out to Your Forest. Your Forest is a podcast about the natural world. Hear stories about the environment, renewable resources, conservation, forestry, hunting, fishing, and more. This is a podcast for those who cannot live without the joys and wonders of all wild things. I'm assuming they don't mean me on a Wednesday night. Find Your Forest wherever you get your podcasts or at yourforestpodcast.com. That's yourforestpodcast.com. All right. How was that for you? That was amazing. I, uh, I mean, you know what that was, Kyle? That was a movie. That was a film. <laughs> that right? was a film that, that we was just watched film. there. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, I have a couple of, uh, a little bit of discomfort with some of it, but, um, I mean, it's How a film. You? Like, yeah, I, I, I think it was, it was really great. I, I will say just off the cuff, it took me a couple minutes to get into it at the beginning. I think even though we're talking about 2D and having that character, it took me a little while to reframe and get into the 50s Cold War mindset. So even sure. the way that it was animated, I was, I was feeling like it was a little dated. And then we can talk maybe more fully about whether the storyline and the narrative still are relevant because that paranoia and like, I mean, I'll identify with it. It's The Cold War was mostly over by the time I was a kid, but, you know, the remnants of those characters have still been around my psyche. But I don't know if, I don't know if like a 15-year-old kid could watch this movie. Well, there's still themes I think that are relevant to today, but I think you're right. I think that whole Cold War mentality, like I know I never really felt it because the Berlin Wall came down by the time I was 10 years right. old. So like, what do I care? Right. Uh, but yeah, so... Well, we'll get into that. So let's do some background information here. The Iron Giant was released on August 6, 1999. The other films released that day, and there's a kind of a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, the big one was The Sixth Sense was released on the same day as The Iron Giant, written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan, starring Bruce Willis, Haley Joel Osment, and Tony Collett. But also Mystery Man was released that day, written by Bob Burden and Neil Cuthbert, directed by Kinka Usher, starring Hank Azaria, Jeannie Garofalo, and Ben Stiller. And also kind of like not as big, but the Thomas Crown Affair, the remake of the Thomas Crown Affair, written by Leslie Dixon and Kurt uh, Wimmer, directed by John McTiernan, starring Pierce Brosnan, Rene Russo, and Dennis Leary. This is probably why I've never watched The Iron Giant. Well, yeah, we'll find out very soon here that you did uh, do very well, but I think that's why. It's because of all these other things. Currently, it is rated 8 on IMDb, 85 on Metacritic. On Rotten Tomatoes, based on 141 reviews from critics, it's 96%. And uh, based on 204,000 user reviews, it's at 90%. It's available on DVD or Blu-ray. You can rent or buy it on iTunes or on Google Play Movies. And you can sort of stream it on Prime Video uh, with what subscription is it? That you need, Hollywood Dave? Suite. Hollywood Suite, which Awful. is uh, a... Big bag of garbage is what I have been uh, led to believe. Well, not that, not that any of us tried it out. But, no, no, uh, just yeah. to let you not know. that I would know that the first 30 days are free and you can immediately cancel your uh, membership after you've watched the applicable, applicable movies for uh, a podcast you might be part of. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, you are recording, by the way, right? Yeah, this is all on okay, record. Good. I might okay, get. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, its budget was $70 million. Mm. It. So actually about half the budget of what Tarzan was last week, just to put that in perspective. However, it opened to 5.7 million, 
Domestically, he would go on to make $23 million, and it didn't really have an international release. So it ended with $23 million on a $70 million budget. It's a flop. Uh, so it, uh, it lost a lot of money. <laughs> lost a lot of money for the studio. Its plot description is, a young boy befriends a giant robot from outer space that a paranoid government agent wants to destroy. It stars Eli Marenthal as Hogarth Hughes, Vin Diesel as the Iron Giant, Harry Connick Jr. as Dean McCoppin, and Christopher McDonald as Kent Mansley. So let's uh, learn a little bit about some of those people. Christopher McDonald. He was born February 15th, 1955. His first film role was the TV movie Getting Married in 1978. It's hard to say what you might consider his breakout role, but it would either be Daryl in Thelma and Louise or Goose in Grease 2. Oh, damn it. I thought we were going Top Gun. That's disappointing. Well, he obviously didn't play Goose in Top damn Gun, it. but... Uh, he's had consistent jobs both on TV and film. Some of his major roles have been in movies such as Fatal Instinct, Grumpy Old Men, Quiz Show, Happy Gilmore, and the remake of Flubber. After lending his voice in The Iron Giant, the early 2000s, he'd be in Isn't She Great, The Skulls, Nurse Betty, Requiem for a Dream, and The Perfect Storm. From IMDb. Christopher McDonald was trained by legendary acting teacher Stella Adler and also at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Chris has been singled out by the New York Times as one of the most prolific actors in Hollywood. He has performed in over 100 films spanning 35 years. Because two siblings and one parent passed away due to cancer, Chris has been an active supporter of the Make-A-Wish Foundation along with charities which help cancer research. He participates in celebrity fundraising events throughout the world. He currently has seven projects in various states of production. The next film you might be able to see is... We Can Be Heroes, that's the new Robert Rodriguez film. Its plot synopsis is, when alien invaders kidnap Earth's superheroes, their children must team up and learn to work together if they want to save their parents and the world. So, in other words, uh, Spy Kids 47. That's exactly what it is, yes. Harry Connick Jr. Harry Connick Jr. was born September 11th, 1967. As a teenager, he studied music at Hunter College and then at the Manhattan School of Music. He released his first album at 19 years old and would come to prominence in film when he wrote the score and sang a few songs for the film When Harry Met Sally. As an actor, his first role was in the 1990 film Memphis Belle, but he'd go on to be in such things as Little Man Tate, Independence Day, and Hope Floats. Memphis Belle is that bomber movie, right? Which one? Memphis Belle. Oh, I don't... Actually, I think you're right. I think it has something to do with the it's military based on the poster. Yeah, with the airplane. Yeah. yeah sorry. After, after the 90s and early 2000s, he would definitely focus more on his music career. His most known role would probably be Leo Marcus on Willing Grace, a TV show in which he appeared on 25 episodes of. But next up is Fear of Rain. R-A-I-N. Fear of Rain. Its plot description is, a girl living with schizophrenia struggles with terrifying hallucinations as she begins to suspect her neighbor has kidnapped a child. The only person who believes her is Caleb, a boy she isn't even sure exists. Sounds like a Bong Jong ho Bong Jong ho <laughs> movie. Yeah, a little bit, huh? Uh, do you have any uh, affinity for Harry Connick Jr.? Um, I don't know. Music or, or acting-wise? He kind of made that uh, smooth... <laughs> smooth jazzy piano thing mm -hmm. uh a, a deal like with the uh, pre i think he just before diana crawl and uh yeah. definitely pre buble i think he paves the way for a buble you know creating <laughs> he, a bit of pre -boob. a pump. he's pre boob he's yeah. pre boob um but uh, i find him uh, such a fascinating character because uh there's two things that i kind of know him from outside like film and, and his music he was a judge on American Idol for I think just one season. Not that I watched American Idol, but I watched clips of him on cool. American Idol. And he very often made people cry <laughs> on that show because yeah. he would not put up with bullshit. He'd be like, that was a bad way you performed that song. It was not good. And I'll tell you why it wasn't good. And he gave very specific examples. And 
he got into a lot of like jazz standards, which he knows of, and also musical theater. And he was like, you have to perform this because it's a performance. These songs were written with a very specific point of view. You sang it nicely, but you performed it awfully. And he would really go into it. Anyways, I always loved him <laughs> from that because it was not just like uh, a Simon Cowell, like, you you suck and that was awful. It was like, here are very specific reasons of why that was bad. And you should go off and fix that if you want to be better. Yeah, I wonder if that's something, it's hard to tell, but if you're classically or academically trained, for example, in music, and you have a frame of thinking yeah. and somebody comes and offends you, it's like it, the the language tends to be, it's like if you uh, send a draft to a writer, you right. know, it's going to be a little bit different than like your buddy who's like, oh, I don't like it. A writer would be like, here's, uh, you know, 60 different uh, grammatical and punctuation yeah. problems and, you know. And fix this. Uh, the other one I remember, there's a YouTube video you can go and find of him in a concert and you'll know this um as i call it the syndrome of white people clapping which is you know a song going on and they're like clap 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 except what happens normally is people usually clap on the first and third instead of the second and fourth like you'd want in a song otherwise it sounds really weird what he does when he notices this is happening and they're clapping kind of on the wrong beat is he adds in an extra note into one bar and forces them to start clapping on the second and fourth and it's so fascinating to watch him like communicate visually to his band and he just delete it and then people start clapping on the right beat and it's such an interesting breakdown of how he's able to do it <laughs> what a what a demarcation of a higher intelligence mm -hmm. it's it's fascinating that's not an easy thing to do i've no not in the moment yeah <laughs> yeah i've played some musical instruments uh poorly in my era and i couldn't even fathom the idea of not only having to concentrate on what I'm doing, but to get the feedback from a live audience and then to manipulate, <laughs> to manipulate my own them, performance yeah. so that they don't look like a bunch of rubes. <laughs> mm. uh, all right. I'm going to send over some of this stuff to you now. The machine wants you to take over. Let's see. Ah, my man, Vin Diesel. Vinny D. I can't believe that I like him now. When he first came out, right? <laughs> I know. When he first, yeah, I know. I was like so anti Vin Diesel when he first came out. And now I can't wait to see him again. Yeah, he's, you know, he's good and everything. He found his thing, which is to just be Vin Diesel. Yeah. Born July 18th, 1967 from IMDb. His first break in acting happened by chance when at the age of seven, he and his friends broke into a theater to vandalize it. A woman stopped them and offered them each a script and $20 each a script and $20 on the condition that they would attend every day after school. From there, Vin's fledgling, Vin's fledgling career progressed from the New York rep Repertory Company run by his father to the off-off Broadway circuit. That story is so full of shit. <laughs> I mean, actually, it never happened? No, but... Uh, I think it actually started when he was... Him and his friends were actually stealing combination VHS and DVD players. <laughs> and uh, then a producer came by and was like, hey, I have a movie script for you. Well, you know what bothers me about this part of the bio is uh, it makes it seem like he's this delinquent that a Hollywood story script of a woman coming in to mm -hmm. save their souls. And then it tells you that his dad ran the New York Repertory right. Company. So he so had a little he, bit of an in. <laughs> he had an in to begin with. So I don't believe the story. for And the other thing is, if he's classically trained, then why was he Vin Diesel at the beginning? Right? <laughs> he's, not a, he's not a great actor. After this, he enrolled in college to be an English major. What? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, he went and tried to get an English degree. I don't know if he completed it, but he went for an English degree. I'm such an asshole. I'm so judgmental. But I mean, it's just like... Um... Sylvester Stallone, like, I think he has an English degree or something like that. Yeah. Because he and writes most of his own scripts and stuff Dolph's like that, like, too. Dolph's got a master's in something. Anyways, this is the thing. I'm just being a dick now. After this, he enrolled in college to be an English major at dot, 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 Hunter College, just like Harry Connick Jr. Interesting. After trying to break into Hollywood, he came back to New York dispirited. His mother gave him a book that convinced him to try and make his own material. His first effort was the short film Multifacial. Oh, God, that sounds like a really bad point. I know, I know. It was made for $3,000 and was accepted to the Cannes Film Festival. This caught the eye of Steven Spielberg, who, vis who cast Vin in Saving Private Ryan. It also convinced Brad Bird to hire him for The Iron Giant. From that early success, he has found himself doing action films, a few comedies, but much of the stuff is his own passion projects. 
He's found himself in a bunch of franchises including Triple X, the Riddick franchise, Guardians of the Galaxy, and probably his most famous series, The Fast and the Furious. Although we have to be careful because Fast and the Furious and The Fast and the Furious are two different movies. That franchise internationally has made almost $6 billion. Up next are two Fast and Furious films, another Riddick film, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and another franchise he'll be a part of, Avatar 2. Yeah, so he's gonna he's in a bunch of stuff coming out. He's making his he's making his. Uh, I have not seen any of the Riddick films. Are those uh, a thumbs up or a thumbs down from you? The I would say the first one's got that sort of gritty indie film. Yeah, that's film Pitch Norm. Black. Is yeah. Pitch Black the first Pitch one? Pitch Black, yeah. and that's actually fairly watchable. Like it's still, yeah, pretty stupid. But it's like it's actually it's got a good, uh, yeah, it's got a good low budget. Feel that you get through it and, and it's quite good uh, the second one was terrible but um i don't even know why i've seen it kyle who am i, <laughs> I why am i, I reviewing know. movies i clearly have no critical uh, eli marin uh marienthal marienthal eli yeah, i don't know e- eli that's the type marienthal. of cigarettes i used to smoke but <laughs> benson and hedges i think for me before i went to belmont's let's not talk about cigarettes pa- i could paul them. malls <laughs> Born March 6th, 1986, he started acting as a teenager. His first credit is the TV movie Unlikely Angel, but he'd also be in the film Jack Frost. Is that the Michael Keaton one? Uh, Maybe keep reading and you'll find out. Not the horror film where the murderous snowman kills unsuspecting victims. Ah, but the Michael Keaton family film where a father dies and his soul winds up in a snowman so that he can learn to love and help his son defeat the bullies tormenting him. In a, in in a, a way. way, in a way, maybe that film is more terrifying. 1999 would be a great year for Eli, as he'd be both in, as he'd be in both The Iron Giant and American Pie. He'd be in a smattering of other films, but his final role would be in Confessions of a Teenage Drama, uh, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen in 2004. He would go to college. He graduated from Brown in 2008. He currently writes poetry and performs with a poetry group called Youth Speaks. I uh, do not do too much of an investigation. I do not know how good the poetry is. I mean, but good enough yeah. to be in a poetry group. So we could make a poetry group. What would our por- poetry group name be called? Mm, that's a good question. Two mics, one cut. No, that's <laughs> oh boy. Directed by Brad Bird, written by Brad Bird and Tim McCanleys, based on the book The Iron Giant, oh, sorry, The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. Tim McCanleys was born in 1953. He wrote such things as North Shore and Secondhand Lions. He also helped in some way to develop the TV show Smallville. He'd also, that's a lot of also, uh, robot. Also, fuck you. He'd also go on to direct Alabama Moon and Angel Sing. Not much to say about Tim. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, I just want to point out the helped in some way to develop the TV show Smallville. If you do go onto his IMDb, not that I did beforehand, I just did right now. He, uh, it says he's uncredited as like helping develop the concept of Smallville. Oh. So I don't know what that means. He was probably in a coffee shop and be like, you know, it'd be cool. Like a Superman, Superman TV is a show. teenager. Damn it. We were <laughs> going to develop that. Now we have to give you something. Yeah. Uh, Brad Bird was born September 24th, 1957. He's been involved in animation for decades. He began with Disney animation doing uncredited animation jobs. His bigger credits include Fox and the Hound, as well as the Black Cauldron. So I think he was doing character animation. So he would just draw the character over and over again. That's still pretty cool. He would go on to be a character layout artist and character designer for The Simpsons in his very early years. No wonder, Kyle, you have such a boner for this guy. (laughs) He would work himself up to be the director of two episodes, Krusty Gets Busted. Do we really need to name the episodes? The first appearance of Sideshow Bob and Like Father, Like Clown. Yeah, you know the classic. I know what (laughs) both of those episodes are, but so I thought that was fun. He'd also direct the music video for Do the Bartman. This would be his first feature-length animated film. It was critically successful, just not successful at the box office. However, it made the people at Pixar take notice. He would be hired by that studio and would make both The Incredibles and Ratatouille, both classic films. The latter would have a co-writer and co-director. 
As far as I remember, Ratatouille was developed by another person. And, and he, he was brought in like it. halfway through the project to punch up the script and like redirect some stuff after the original creator was fired. Hmm. He would take his success in animation to try and direct live action. His first attempt would be a huge success. Mission Impossible 4. That, that's the one with the Burj Khalifa, yes, right? So, like that's so the good. That, that revitalized, revitalized mm-hmm. Mission Impossible. I mean, I guess what's his name's J.J. Uh, Abrams 3 is fine. but uh, Yeah. And that has Philip Seymour Hoffman in it, which is fun. I know, but they started the Carrie Russell character, which no, not okay. uh, what was that? His wife, Anyways. my wife. Yeah, his second try would not be Tomorrowland. I didn't really mind Tomorrowland. But yeah, Tomorrowland is again, it's it's fine. It's not great. It's not awful. It's just there. Next up, supposedly, is a long gestating project called 1906. Its plot description. A young man discovers a series of secrets and lies that left San Francisco highly vulnerable to the fires that engulfed it in the aftermath of the historical 1906 earthquake. This is how long I have known about the movie 1906, is that I am pretty sure I read this on IMDb in 2007. Oh my god. It's been that long that he's been trying to develop this. I don't know if it'll ever be actually made, to be honest. Well, it's interesting to think about like how long has it been since you hear about Brad? Because when when he moved over to Mission Impossible, like he was he was going to be a big deal, and that was a, a huge hit. Yeah, I, I knew him from The Incredibles and Ratatouille, so I right. knew him from this Pixar stuff. And so when I heard that he had been hired on to direct Mission Impossible Four, I was like, oh, weird, interesting that they're bringing an animation director in to direct this uh, live mm-hmm. action movie. But I, so I'm well. pretty sure he was he was trying to develop 1906 as a as a Pixar project for the longest time. Uh, well, anyways. All right, let's move on. What are your thoughts? What are your uh, immediate thoughts of watching The Iron Giant? Um, it's it's great. I I think, I don't know how to put it. I mean, it's a film that you, you see. <laughs> it is a film, yes. Well, I mean, I guess I mean that in the most judgmental way possible. I think it's got uh it's got a little bit of everything it's it's i don't it's hard to say with animation film but it's yeah it's well directed you know the, the way everything moves together how we're introduced to characters how the characters are developed we're introduced to stories of like single motherhood um this boy that's living in his imagination the outcast uh, the uh the alien stuff you know with this mm-hmm. robot i love the way that it's developed, that the robot has to overcome its amnesia and these uh, memories, you know, that uh, up to that point, he had been quite a benign character. And then it turns right. out that he's uh, like your robot, like an angry piece of shit. <laughs> Son and- of a bitch robot, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to remind me to kill you. I mean, that's the thing that I love about animation, whether it is 2D or 3D, to be honest. Um, and sometimes what people will criticize it on is that you are able to get exactly the right like facial expression. The, so the acting choices are like so deliberate inside of animation. But I enjoy that so much is that you can take even maybe a flat vocal performance in a way and still form that into something good. I still think that voice actors are not respected as much as they should be, to be brutally honest. But Well, the, the voice actors in America aren't that good. Like I can't, for example, I, at least the ones that do the, uh, let's say the reacting for all of the anime ports. Uh, they're mm, terrible. Mm. I can't watch any anime in English. I think they're awful. And whoever casts them has absolutely no concept of how people talk. They're they're terrible. Um, movie like shows and movies that are developed here either rely on celebrities who are already established um, as being emotive, or developed uh, in a way that you know the I, th- I suspect the voices are are in line with how they animate them. But in Japan, the voice actors are celebrities. Like you know that, right? Like yeah. uh, you know, if you're the voice of Naruto, like people interview on TV. <laughs> right. It's yeah, it's, it's a very different culture. I, I. But there are some like long term voice actors here in North America, the people that are, that are cast uh, and have been in the business a long time. Like there are people that are very talented at what they do. Of course. Well, I guess my main point was here is that this is such a unique vision that Brad Bird is bringing to this. Like he knows exactly what he wants. Interestingly enough, I find that Brad Bird tends to really be interested in like 1950s stuff. Cause every one of his films kind of has a, an infusion of 1950s style certainly he was born in the 50s so maybe that's part of it but um this is no 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 stranger to that 
And I think that, it, that it's important that this film is also, again, kind of going back to our discussion about Disney, even though this is not a Disney film, it is very much coming down, hey, violence and guns are bad. Uh, but, I, but I did write down what I think is like the central metaphor that uh, really cut me this time when I was rewatching it. There's a lot that people can pull out and why I still think it's relevant, even if maybe the the very specific setting is not as relevant anymore, which is it's bad to kill, but it's okay to die. That is what one of the characters say in the film. And I think that there's such a, it's almost a high level theme to put into a kid's movie. Uh, I don't see this as because a kid's it's, movie. it's hard to really understand what that even means. I think in a kid, in a kid's mind, but what a powerful statement to make. I don't see this as a kid's movie. I, and this might be just the influence of, uh, you know, did your, he, sorry, did your son watch this with you at all or no? No, he he couldn't. It was uh, too violent at the beginning. Yeah. And uh, I think like, you know, and uh, coming from uh, a youth with connections with manga and anime, which are all cartoons, but they're made for adult audiences. I don't have a, such a strong connection that animation is just for children. The, I don't see this movie as being a kid's movie at all. Uh, mm hmm you know at the beginning it has a has a naivety to it but even the way it's animated it's quite creepy it's uh the paranoia is set even before the agent appears like in the television show that they're depicting a horror film that he's watching it's supposed to be funny but only adults will think that that's cute right i don't think mm -hmm. a kid's looking at that and watching you know a uh, hogarth watching a you know a late night uh, 30s black and white uh, monster movie with a brain that's eating people that's not yeah, kid friendly, and then going out, and the it's so beautifully depicted, like the, the 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 fear of being in a dark wood by himself. Even as a kid growing up in this uh, sort of backcountry small town thing, he, he's he's petrified as as that night goes sour. Uh, yeah, so I, number one, I don't, I don't see this as a kids movie at all. I I think this is a movie made for adults. Uh, but just well, then, even, okay, and then this, even just coming at it from an adult perspective, what do you think about that idea then that well, it's okay, it's not okay to kill, but it is okay to die? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely sort of a central premise. There's a bit of American heroism in that. Uh, on the gun point, for example, you know, he takes his BB gun out, and you got that. I can't remember which character it is, uh, not Huckleberry Finn, but uh, maybe <laughs> David. What's the one with the with the raccoon head? But uh, Davy Crockett. Oh, Davy Crockett. Yeah, yeah. But you get like this sort of uh, American solo adventurer feel. Like, so he gets his kid's gun, but he's got a kid's gun. And so it's not a, there's nothing negative uh, about gun culture. I think it had a broader statement, less about guns, but about war. And clearly with the nuclear paranoia and this idea of uh, a general assuming that it's better <laughs> to blow themselves up or, well, at least this uh, paranoia. But I mean, even the appearance of the army in this movie. Uh, it's just so over the top and uh, explainable only in the context in which this story takes place. You can't tell the same story today. I don't think people will understand. As much as we live in greater fear in a personal level, I don't think people understand anymore what Cold War living was like. Mm. Well... In a way, I, yeah, that's a hard question to understand. I, definitely not Cold War specifically of like, I am afraid of the Soviet Union dropping bombs on us tomorrow. But I think that there is still this sense of uneasiness of like, our way of life could change just like that in, in, a, in a moment. And I think definitely the whole COVID-19 has really shown people that what we consider society is not as rock tight as what you might think it actually is. Things can make uh, make things change very well, very quickly i've brought it up before but i think it you know by repeating it it really plays this point i think what breaks this is 9 11 because it yeah. actually happened it wasn't a nuclear bomb but the image of what it meant to be american and to be the most powerful and the biggest weapons got broken on one day and now they live in a state of perpetual change and fear because you know before with russian nuclear things cuban missile crisis of course those were real historical and very, very frightening events, but nobody blew up a bomb, at least that wasn't an internal domestic terrorist 
um, at that point. And like we were talking about, the gun violence in high schools and stuff was starting to come out even by the late 90s. But Well, yeah, and, Columbine happened in 1999. Right. So. And that was, but that was still considered like shocking, right? Yes. When that came yeah. out, that was, that was something. But what was weird is by 2000, people weren't talking about it anymore that much. Uh, and it took to 2001. Now, all, you still make movies about people capturing planes and, you know, blowing people up. And uh, if it's not anymore so strongly anti-Islam, it's like there's always a terrorist with some thing that it's going to be a dirty bomb or a virus or, you know, like, so the, the mechanisms of fear have changed quite a bit. The more I'm thinking of the, about this, this would make a really good uh, video series that someone else will have to make. I'm not going to do it. But you have the Iron Giant in 1999, whose main thesis is like, violence is not maybe the best option that there is a way or even more to that. I think what really the subtext is that even if you've been trained for war, you still have a choice to say, no, that right. I don't want to go down that route. If we contrast that with Iron Man in 2008, yes, you can have say there's a similar one in that first movie of Tony Stark understanding that, Oh, I don't want my company to be an agent of war anymore. But then he himself becomes an agent of war. The resolution of that and in that series is basically like, as sure. long as I'm a good person, that I can kill people and it's okay. It's <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's a bit of a difference after 9-11 of yeah. how I think this gets uh, this movie gets made. It's about uh, who carries the bigger stick. And mm -hmm. I think that that was... Well, it's like, and it's all about like benevolent dictators, right? It's all fine to live under a dictatorship if they're good. But then you have no way to know if that's what's going to happen. That's one of the things, I mean, not to spend too much time on MCU and the Avengers, but I think they struggled the most as an overarching storyline trying to wrestle with that, you know, and, mm. and using Tony Stark and Captain America and all these people to try to represent very complex views of that political theory of, of whether you can have benevolent dictator. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a paradox. It's a conflict. But, you know, that thinking is what generated the Cold War. It was about... Uh, fear, manipulation, and tyranny, but they were in a loop. It, you know, America kept pretending they were in a democracy, but uh, they were building and constantly spending money on having bigger sticks. You know, if, if they hear even a rumor that Russia's got whatever it was, like a million nukes, they would just be like, okay, well, now we have to have 10 million. It's not even about strategic striking. It's like, we just need to have the most. It's the only way we'll have peace in the world. And, uh, and that bred a lot. I, I just saw this thing on uh, YouTube. It's a little off, off, but it was uh, a woman that had just uncovered the diary of her Japanese mother during internment in the Second World War. And so, like, if we want to talk about the effects of paranoia and fear-based thinking and then violence, I mean, there's so many examples in human history about, about that. So, I, yeah, I agree with you in bringing back to the Iron Giant. I mean, I, I think the underlying thing is... Brad Bird's trying to trying to bring this warmer, empathetic storyline that friendship, love, relationship, communication, language is the basis of the future, um, or like a survival future. He probably watched a lot of Star Trek, maybe rather than mm -hmm. Star Wars. Like, there's just something about collaboration and unity. But uh, I think there is a reason why he is intentionally making this a 1950s story rather than a 1990s story. Um, I think he wanted to put that distance so that it wasn't as obvious that he was critiquing. Actually, this is actually about today rather than it was from uh, 40 years ago sort of thing. At least that's what it feels like to me. Well, I, agree I think that maybe part of it is like why I love this movie so much is that why it's so relevant to me as an individual is that, oh, yeah, this feels like very 90s, like hopeful attitude about the future where I don't know, maybe someone who had never seen it who was coming at it today would not have the same uh, insight or or warmth to it. It's weird. We've reviewed, I can't name them anymore, but we've re reviewed movies we like where being sort of a period drama and being in a capsule uh, makes it more timeless. But for whatever reason, in my opinion, this one, it grays out the narrative a little bit. And I think maybe because I, I have, uh, I think I was clearly not a cognitive adult <laughs> during the cold war at least as far as you know if we're going to demark it as the fall of the berlin wall i think what is that like 88 90, 92 92 I think, so technically. i'm like 13 right like i 
so I'm able to read the news and understand that something big happened, but I, you know, I'm not really living in that paranoia, right? The after effect in culture is still there. So I'm, I'm still aware of like the idea of the communist is the evil one. And, you know, we're a free mm-hmm. democracy and all that kind of bullshit as it turns out. But, but I don't know what it is about this movie. I, that was my, that was my problem with it. So the story, the way it moves, the way it's animated, all the characters, uh, I loved it. You know, it, it's, uh, it's so well written. But at the same time, I find myself uh, stumbling a bit because I also feel like I think it's it's the bad guy. It's the the I don't know, I can't remember his name, but the uh, paranoid agent. I think mm-hmm. that's where it falls apart for me. He's just too cruel. You know, he tortures a kid. We have we have uh, the four lights. He, I, just, scene. I, I, I wrote this down, by the way, in this movie, an adult man chloroforms a young boy <laughs> not just i mean he interrogates him like he yeah. psychologically manipulates him i mean this is such a cold war thing like there's no lines with that one character but it's not represented any there's no opposite extreme there's nobody that's particularly fully night nice. maybe the beatnik maybe Heraconic. i don't know but he's just such a hippie that it doesn't play as a as a contrast and as the uh, paranoid agent starts really losing his mind to the point in, you know, the culmination of calling down the nukes, I, I was just getting upset at that point because uh, I don't know if it's believable. Uh, I understand why it's written that way and I understand the point that they're trying to make. But at that point, it was like, uh, I kind of just, I was, I was just getting upset. I, I couldn't, I couldn't stay in it. I almost just wanted to punch the TV. It, it was, mm. it was too violent for me. Uh, not in a gory way, but in a psychological way. And I think that that story and that bad guy exists in a Cold War rhetoric, but even in the terrorist world we live today, you don't really see a lot of stories where a grown man sneaks into the house under false pretenses, wiretaps a 10-year-old boy, kidnaps him, chloroforms him, tortures him, interrogates him. That's my idea of a perfect weekend. The shit that he was doing in this movie just gets to the point where like, and then I think, you know what made it worse for me? At the end, there's no resolution. He's like put into a truck and driven away. And like, that's the end of the movie for him. I I don't know. Do I need to see him tortured or killed? <laughs> Maybe. No, that's, I, I, that is a good actually criticism you're leveling. There, there's, even though he's court-martialed ostensibly, like that's what I'm assuming he's going to. We don't actually ever have that catharsis of him getting his comeuppance that you normally get for a villain in this type of film. Whether that's like, you know, him being hanged by a vine in Tarzan <laughs> or or uh, even something like, like lesser, like, or, yeah. right, like there's nothing uh, as grandiose as that. I guess you could argue that that's the movie isn't as interested in that as it is the, the relationship between Hogarth and the the Iron Giant itself. But um, I don't know. I, I don't have as big of a problem with that. And I wonder if you being a father has a has a way that's it's sneaking its way into into that reading. It's that's very possible. Uh, I wonder. The thought I just had is it's it's leaving open end almost in a justification that acting that way is still allowed up to a certain line. You know, mm. because at the beginning when he shows up in the town, he's a bit of a rube, right? And and he's got this delusion, but. He's a comedic foil. The kid makes him shit himself. Like, you know, it, right. you don't think that he's going to turn into this uh, this monster. And, and then as he escalates, you know, and, and turns it into such a violent thing. Uh, but then at the end, he just leaves. It's weird. There's a theory that I have that I think I even read somewhere. I don't know how original this is, but definitely the 80s, but I think even more so in the 90s you start to have these TV shows and movies that the undercurrent is don't trust the government. Sure. Um, and I'm thinking like X-Files is like the biggest example of that, but there's, there's a bunch of them that came out it's in the, the 90s. the man, man. Yeah. Right. Where it's like the G man or the people in the FBI, they're lying to you and you shouldn't trust them. And I'm not here to get into like the nitty gritty of like whether you should or not. Uh, but I will say I, I, that that is part of the theme here is like, hey, the government actually doesn't have your best interest at heart. Well, this is the part where I've, I worry that's a bit apologetic is that it's this one character who's neurotic, but the general doesn't want to believe him. The president doesn't want to believe him. The administration, they were leaving, right? 
Mm-hmm. And of course, when they see a quote unquote threat, they react to it, but they focus all of the evil intent on one character, which becomes a little apologetic of the system. It's like, you know, it's not wrong to have nukes. It's not wrong that we have a submarine sitting like half a kilometer outside a small fishing town in America that, you know, can launch nuclear weapons at any time. It's it's weird. Like, those are not question. We're left at the end with one insane person torturing an entire town, <laughs> about to unleash the nuclear apocalypse, and then one kind-hearted robot that... Uh, you know, reacts to that and becomes this like super killing machine. It it just gets a little twisted at the end for me to to feel uh, good about. I think, um, and it, even at the end, like getting the screw for this like nice um, tie up that the boy is not left bereft of a friend. I would have loved it if even if the screws like wiggling out the window, if that had been the end of the movie. But this sure. this last two minutes of it going to where is Antarctica and rebuilding yeah. the robot is you know it's just like why why do we need <laughs> why he's coming back because it's because weird. goodness will save the day David. <laughs> yeah but they could have, have been hope. represented simply with just even one piece but now this killing machine still exists it's uh it's a weird movie the whole ending scene is interesting to me because really early in the film it's even seeded to the fact that Hogarth mentions I don't want to tell this person the truth because they always wig out and they start shooting. And and I think that's based on like the old science fiction films he's seen watching where that is basically what happens. Any type of monster comes out, let's just shoot it and see what and happens. ask questions later sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that he, that's his resolution and his journey is at the end is like, Hey, stop, let me go and talk to him. And then he realizes what's going on. It's this part of his uh, programming. He's able to fight against the, the, the iron giants able to fight against I also want to mention that uh, we haven't really talked about it, but I do think there was actually some pretty funny moments that happened in, in this movie. In particular, I love the way that they animate Hogarth's facial expressions. For whatever reason, it kills me, especially in that one part where he's like given espresso and he's like talking, he's, yeah, like, yeah. Blah, 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 like he's going a million <laughs> miles a minute. A, I've been around kids who do exactly that without coffee. So it's like it felt so in tune to that character. Um, and I don't know. I just like part of it is too, and I recognize my own bias with this is that I really, really love films that are basically a coming of age story. And this is basically what that is. It's him as a young boy kind of learning the ways of the world in like a harsh, harsh way. And so I'm just geared to like this type of movie more than other people will probably. I don't know. I, I would be in the same boat. I, I like, uh, the good coming of age story. I I love this, the way that this is uh, animated. I did have the, you know, pause at the beginning because it's intentionally set in a 50s tone, not just with the vehicles, but even the animation style at the beginning mm-hmm. uh, harkens back to a bygone era. I mean, who knows if Brad Bird is drawing so much on his, now that I'm learning his anim- Disney animation past. I thought the initial appearance of the Iron Giant felt a little Futurama to me. It was just a little bit jarring right. when they mixed the two together. But by the end, I don't even notice it. It's just played so well. From what I understand, yeah, this was the first time they'd really done a, a, an entire character for an entire movie being completely uh, 3D animated while the rest of it is 2D animated. So they had to learn some tricks on how to make that work. And speaking of last week's episode, Tarzan, I love that Vin Diesel doesn't learn to speak fluent English. I right. mean, it's it's left to you, even without the emotive face, I mean, he has one, but it's left easily for you to understand that there's a compassion and friendship that builds here uh, because of Hogarth's open mind, if you want to put it that way. And by the end, uh, what a great hero. Like, it's it's fun to watch the, the robot, even as the robot falls and becomes this uh, world-destroying machine, you worry for it, <laughs> which is why yeah. the movie's so good. It's like, it plays well enough that I'm like, I'm dr- by the end, I'm like really drawn into it. It's just, there's these little points where I, I'm, yeah, I had little stumbling blocks. And the final stumbling block is, uh, I don't know, this is the 50s things too, like the beatnik character is no longer a trope. Like, it's hard sure. to comprehend that dude i thought you wouldn't let your kid hang out with some rando in a junkyard it's not Uh, bad so much i feel like at the beginning i thought he was going to be the secret agent hmm. he's just so awkward and weird in that town that i thought because i didn't know that a real secret agent was going to show up i thought he was going to either be 
the savior, which he kind of turned into, or he was going to be the villain. The way he just really stood out. Uh, and then by the time he's like showing that he does art with the junk, like I started buying it a bit, but it was just, it took me a little while to yeah. to to warm up to it. Uh, I do I do like his one phrase because he stands up for the guy who says, like, I saw like this big machine man. And he's like, well, why did you why did you stand up for that guy? He says, like, if if you don't stand up for the kooks, who will? Yeah, yeah. I I, I like that kind <laughs> of uh, mentality too. It's like, hey, he has every bit of a, of a right to <laughs> claim what he claims. Um, I do wonder though. I mean, part of it is that because now I'm an adult and this is obviously all post nine eleven stuff. Is like if this was set in modern day, it would almost feel unnatural not to have like the characters who are like. Actually, the there'd be like the two opposing sides of like the the Iron Dragon is all peaceful, all loving, and the other one's like he's like the devil and is here to destroy all humanity. Um, and then people being like, actually, there is no Iron Giant; it's all a manufacturer of the government. And so you'd have to like contend with all these different points of view from the the townsfolk. I was going to say we need we need a, at least one tinfoil hat character. I yeah. I don't know. You know the the other reason why this won't play is because terror and fear after nine eleven has become like yeah dirty boss like it's more uh, covert and uh, insidious. It's not a giant mm -hmm. machine. It's not sci fi like it's not thirties sci fi anymore. You know like a terrorist can't construct you know an alien creature that stands above the trees. So um, the but visual it sort of effects. It's, it it's gonna, is nice to to go back to those films and be like. Man, wouldn't it, wasn't it nice yeah, to be times. afraid of just a thing instead of like society? Because that's harder to like wrap your head around. Even and not the, again. I'm I feel like I'm over obsession with the MCU universe because I'm not a huge huge fan. But they are even even Thanos portrayed almost more like a terrorist leader at the beginning. Yeah. It's these like small cells that are you know when he's in the first Avengers movie they open this giant portal and it's like fifty things come out at once. It's not even this grand army that apparently he has the whole time. So, uh, yeah, the tone and the characterization of evil has changed quite yeah. a bit. That uh, I still don't understand how that snake thing floats, but... We're done here. Okay, Fart, well, the it's farting machine, the whole time. It's, it's, <laughs> the, the machine has asked us to wrap this up. So, let's first, let's get into some trivia here. So, Brad Bird was in part inspired to make this movie as a memorial to his sister Susan, who died at the hands of her husband by gun violence. His pitch for the movie to the studio was, what if a gun had a soul and didn't want to be a gun? Wow. I think that's an interesting way to start off from. Hmm. Excluding the yells and groans, the Iron Giant only says a total of 53 words. Vin right. Diesel got a payday for 53 words. Well, I just think the movie works better for him. All right, I'm going to send over some stuff here uh, for you, Dave. You can read the final two pieces of trivia. Oh, it's actually interesting. For once, robot. Um, <laughs> I hope you choke on your coffee. Was originally meant to be a musical. <laughs> Pete Townsend and Des McAnuff. Des McAnuff. He's a Des, Canadian. Des McAnuff developed it as a stage musical using songs from Pete Townsend's concept album, The Iron Man, much like the stage version of The Who's Tommy. Des McAnuff decided it would work better as an animated feature and pitched it to Warner Brothers. Wait, as a live person musical, presumably? Presumably, yes. Uh, anyways, anyways, Des McAnuff is very well known in the theater world. He was involved with just a bunch of different like high-profile productions on Broadway, some of them actually starting in Toronto and then transferring over to there. He was also like the head of the Stratford Festival, so, so the big Shakespeare festival that happens in in Canada here. Stratford, um, Ontario, yeah. That's correct. But yeah, he's big. He's a big name in musical theater, is what I'm trying to say. The 1999 film is based on a novel, The Iron Man. The author of the novel, Ted Hughes, who bears the same name as the characters Annie and Hogarth Hughes, wrote the novel as a way of comforting his children after the suicide of their mother, Sylvia Plath. Yeah, if wow. you did not know that, yes, <laughs> Ted Hughes is married to Sylvia Plath. And uh, much like Courtney Love is sometimes... Uh, criticized for actually helping kill his wife interesting it's like yeah. uh in the austin powers thing austin powers thing um what's the what's number two's uh what's that actor robert wagner oh yeah right, right, right. and uh natalie wood natalie wood anyways uh a quick note isn't uh annie hughes is rachel isn't it yes it is yeah it's um so weird 
right? Uh, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston, yeah. As That's the second Jennifer Aniston movie we have seen this mm. year. Uh, uh, yeah. All right, so let's get to, to our ratings. So out of five, what would you rate this movie? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I would, I think I would give it a four. I think mm. a four. I, I would want to give it more, but I, I just have a lot of little hangups. And I mean, we've kind of mentioned in passing, but I just, I just don't see this movie holding up that well without the nostalgia either of growing up in the 90s, understanding Cold War rhetoric, or, um, or just like looking for this specific type of movie. I don't know if it has a universal appeal anymore. So, mm. Well, um, <laughs> I think this is the perfect movie. So maybe I'm just wrapped up into that nostalgia too much and I can't uh, see it with fresh eyes. I'm giving this a five. I'm Ooh. giving it a perfect five. rating. And so that averages out to 4.5, which means that the Iron Giant will be entering our list in the number three position that's pretty good. Uh, currently. So that's where it's going to be. Will it stay there? Who knows? But you can check out our full list by going to letterbox.com slash KDVSTM. Uh, KDVSTM, by the way, is also our handle for both Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, we haven't mentioned it for a couple of weeks, but if you do want to help support us, you definitely can do so by rating us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And by all means, on any of those platforms, you can send us a message if you want to give us your own two cents. We also take checks, cash, cash. and uh, yeah. we will barter for food. I actually do take Discover cards. So let's see what we're watching next week here, uh, Dave. Oh, this is really weird. This uh, this machine seems to be on a tear of having us watch animated films. We're going to be watching South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut next week. Hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. Have you seen that ep since it came out, or no? N no, I. Oh, you're not, you're not a you're not a South Park guy. I'm not a South Park guy. I think. Uh, oh, we're gonna have like a big disagreement probably next week. Then I don't know. Well, I think we mentioned it before off off mic, but I, you know, I was thinking on top of uh, Team America, which I reluctantly watched and I like died laughing. Yeah. Was uh, basketball was one of my guilty oh, pleasures yeah. for a while too. Baseball is great. And I, I'm not, a, I, it's nothing against uh, Trey Parker or Matt Stone. I think my problem with South Park was that I, like you, was actually really big into The Simpsons when uh, South Park mm -hmm. first came out. And I thought it was, like Beavis and Butt, I thought it was just this like lowbrow, you know, right. uh, MTV sh shit. This, I, I, I judged it without watching it. And then once it blew up, I just couldn't get on the train. So I don't, I haven't watched the movie. I don't think I've ever watched a full episode of South Park. And look, like, my South Park knowledge largely likely at this point comes from YouTube clips. Uh, I got, yeah. I will, I will fill you in next week about everything that you need to know. That's <laughs> what, uh, that's what he said. Uh, anyways, uh, can you just, <laughs> can you just dispose of this gun for me? Can you just take it with you? I'm pretty sure if you push this button, it'll just revert back into your, and then I don't know what word you want to use there, Kyle, but, uh, <laughs> You know, whatever appendage you think became that gun, you just you just push that button right there. 